Marijuana has grown up and gone legit. From the shadowy dives of the 1930s to the reefer madness hysteria of the 1950s to the yellow submarine ride of the 60s to where we are now, marijuana as medicine. Decades ago, it was quietly procured for glaucoma patients, the first inkling that the stuff could ease pain and provide comfort. Cancer sufferers in their 70s, many of whom would never dream of firing up at a Marley concert, were now imploring their children to score them a joint or two to get them through another chemo session. But on January 1st, 2013, by way of ballot box, medical marijuana became legal in Massachusetts. The law eliminated criminal and civil penalties for possession and use of a 60-day supply of marijuana for patients with state-issued registration cards, all dependent on physician referral. There are no actual medical marijuana dispensaries in Hampshire County, but they are soon to be here and in Franklin County as well. Are we ready? We all have a rough idea how it's all supposed to work, but it can get pretty complicated and questions pile up one after another. We are live at JFK Middle School in Northampton, Mass. I'm Bob Flaherty, morning host on 96.9 WHMP. As Denise Fozella, Laurie Loisel, Bill Newman, Kristen Palpini, Al Williams, and I present a WHMP Daily Hampshire Gazette Northampton Community TV Forum, Medical Marijuana, What's the Prescription? Making a new law make sense. We'll be getting to the bottom of a variety of things this evening, like how to access medical marijuana, which doctors certify patients, how different strains of the drug work better with certain ailments, how to know which methods of ingestion are best for you, and how to keep law enforcement off your back, considering that no matter what laws are passed statewide, it can still be trumped by federal law. However, this program is not intended to be a debate over the legitimacy of marijuana. We've long since arrived at that point. This is all about the next step, a step into a brave new world. Our panelists this evening, Dr. Jill Griffin of Northampton, former Chief of Emergency at Mercy Hospital, whose private practice focuses on certifying patients for medical marijuana use. Michael Cutler, a Northampton lawyer who counsels applicants for medical marijuana dispensary licenses, advises doctors, and has been a longtime advocate for drug policy reform. Paul McNeil, coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition, which advocates for prevention and intervention to reduce teen substance use. Ezra Parzibach, medical marijuana educator and owner of the Cannabis Consultant in Northampton. Northwestern Assistant District Attorney and Chief Trial Attorney Jeremy Bucci on law enforcement's role in all of this. And Bob Gunther, a terminally ill cancer patient who uses marijuana medicinally. So for panelists, feel free to ask questions of one another. Uh, just give me a signal if you want to respond to something another panelist says or just cut in and go for it. Uh, we will devote time in each segment for audience members to question our panelists. We have a microphone stand right here. So you can step up to the microphone. We'll do that a little bit later in the show. Uh, just wake your, make your way up here, or you can get Laurie Loisel's attention. You could also pass us a note to read. There's also a table over in the uh, far corner that you can uh, write notes or what have you, any information that you want to pass to us there. Uh, to those watching or listening at home, you can tweet a question to Kristen Palpini at hashtag MedPotForum. That's hashtag M-E-D-P-O-T. F-O-R-U-M, hashtag MedPotForum. You can also call WHMP's producer in the studio, Michael Sokol, at 586-7140. He'll relay questions to us. This NCTV, WHMP, Daily Hampshire Gazette simulcast, Medical Marijuana, What's the Prescription? Making a New Law Make Sense will be rebroadcast tomorrow morning from 8 to 10 a.m. on WHMP 96.9 FM 1400 and 1600 a.m. A podcast will be available tomorrow. We are also live streamed anytime at whmp.com. So, our first hour of questioning will be conducted by WHMP's news director, Denise Vozella, and Daily Hampshire Gazette's web editor, Kristen Palpini. Denise. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> We're going to start with Dr. Jill Griffin. Uh, the New England Treatment Access is, is nearing the final hurdle to open the dispensary on Conn Street in Northampton, as well as another in Brookline and a marijuana cultivating plant in Franklin. Uh, this will be the only one in Franklin County. Do we know how soon they're going to be opening and what your relationship would be with the dispensary? 
Um, we don't know how soon they'll be opening. Um, we, knew, we do know that two weeks ago that they were given final approval to continue moving forward, but um, you have to finish your build out, then you have to be signed off again by the DPH, and then you can put your seeds in the ground. And from my understanding, um, it would take three to four months to uh, grow the marijuana and get it started. And I forgot the second half of your question. <laughs> your relationship with the dispensary, you're, you're going to be a, a prescribing doctor. So it's a little in announcement there. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. Um, marijuana is called a Schedule One drug, which means that I can't write a prescription for it. It's uh, classified as an illegal drug that has no medical benefit and is highly addictive. So um, I can't prescribe it. All I can do is certify that a patient meets criteria to use it, and to have, that criteria would be that you have a debilitating medical condition that interferes with one or more of your daily life activities. Um, in a perfect world, I would be able to have a relationship with each dispensary, and especially the one that's in my own community, so that I could talk to the people at the dispensary about um, dosing, about the types of strains, about how I'd like certain conditions treated, but that's illegal for me. Uh, so I can have no relationship with the dispensary whatsoever. So who makes those decisions for the patient if you can't prescribe the marijuana? You're just certifying that a patient is in need of it. Who makes the decisions on dosage and, and all of those other things that need to be decided? Well, there's really, really very well done studies that show that self-dosing, for example, using handheld vaporizer, that people can very quickly learn to self-dose it if they're inhaling it. Um, eating it, it takes a little bit more practice, but in the dispensary setting, what they'll do is they'll have their own medical director and their team will put together educational materials and train their own intake workers to make recommendations for specific strains. And quite honestly, I'm not an, an expert on marijuana strains, so they may do just fine having someone who's used marijuana for years um, recommending the strains that work for different conditions. So how do you become a doctor who is certified to, or, or who is uh, authorized to certify patients for medical marijuana usage? Um, in Massachusetts, you have to have a valid DEA license. You have to have a, um, a clean uh, record with the Board of Registration in Medicine, meaning there's no restrictions on your practice. You have to take two credits of approved continuing medical education, you have to have one brick and mortar location where you see patients. And do I need anything else, Michael? Well, you, for each uh, patient, you need to check the, the monitoring program, too. Oh, that's right. There's a prescription monitoring program, and for every patient, we have to check that ahead of time uh, to uh, see the medications that they're currently taking and then review two years worth of medical records and then make a decision as to whether or not they qualify. Well, if I might, Jill, uh, if you wouldn't mind filling in some of the rest of your background, you have somewhat more than two hours of uh, continuing medical education credits from which to make your practicing oh, decisions. The state requirement is two hours, which I lobbied against because I thought if, if you only had two hours, that was ridiculous. Um, and I lobbied that you either take a lot of training or you learn from your patients. And um, I have almost 300 hours an hour of continuing medical education um, specific to medical marijuana. Are you the only doctor in Hampshire County who is authorized to certify patients, or are there others? Um, I don't know at this point because the regulations changed recently. But I can tell you that I'm the only one that does this full time. And is that I would a new thing for you since the law passed. It is new. Kristen, Kristen knows uh, from before. I had um, started a house call business by bicycle, and I was riding my bicycle around making house calls. And um, after the law passed in 2013, um, I was seeing some very ill patients, and they began asking for it. And that's how I started learning about it. And I got busy, and now I do it full time, and I make my house calls, not on my bicycle, unless they're close by. I, 
I go out in my car on Fridays and drive to people's houses. Now, there are a number of doctors who aren't going to certify, and some of them say it's because they're worried about federal ramifications. Is that something you're worried about, or, or not? You know, I think the person best to address that would be Michael Cutler, my attorney. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jill. Uh, there are several protections that uh, health care workers uh, have in dealing with the state medical marijuana law, both state law and federal law, surprisingly. Although, as, as Jill mentioned, the feds haven't recognized the medical benefit of marijuana yet, and I should say that they're actively undergoing a review under the Obama administration at this time. Um, there are several protections built into the law. First of all, under the state law, uh, health care workers, uh, health care providers, uh, primarily physicians, but osteopaths as well, and under regulations that I understand are pending, nurse practitioners uh, practicing under a physician supervision will also be able to certify. But uh, the law says a physician or other health care professionals under a physician supervision shall not be penalized under Massachusetts law in any manner or denied any right and privilege uh, for acting in compliance with uh, the state law. Federal law protection exists as well. Under a, uh, a federal appellate court decision that the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, chose not to review that's been in effect for 12 years, uh, there's a permanent injunction against the um, against the, the Justice Department, the uh, part of the government that licenses doctors to be federal prescribers, uh, about opening up even an investigation of their license if the conduct on which they would choose to investigate them is only the certification of patients. Let me roll that back a little bit. A doctor's act of discussing uh, a patient's medical history and their amenability to marijuana and giving them an informed consent uh, whether they uh, to under to explain the risks and potential benefits uh, of the uh, medicine to them that process of talking to the patient and then giving them a certification which the patient then leaves the doctor's office with and obtains uh, the medicine with that act is protected under the First Amendment and although this particular court decision was was uh, did not get reviewed by the Supreme Court in a subsequent Supreme Court case uh, the uh, Supreme Court made reference to that lower court case, and uh, which which gives it uh, somewhat uh, a firm imprimatur, and that was in 2005. And in 2006, in the Oregon right to die cases, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court explicitly said that if a state medical if a state medical practice is uh, uh, if a state authorizes a particular type of a medical practice, the feds have no business second guessing that as a matter as a matter of a doctor's federal licensure. So that's a somewhat longer answer to the question, do doctors have anything to fear from participating uh, in this program? So are the doctors who are using this as a reason not to get involved in the program misinformed or, or is something larger going on? Is, is there some feeling in the medical community that this, that medical marijuana just doesn't cut it? Well, uh, let me, I want to hand this off to a sure. medical professional, but let me just suggest that in, in the work that I've done with, with other doctors and some of the doctor training I've done around the state is that after years of, uh, of, of hectoring at the federal level about how Chi Jin Chong medicine, I think, is what one drug czar uh, said, and that drug czar, of course, was a general and why he would be a, a, a making medical judgments is an open question. But uh, after years of hectoring and stigmatization within the profession, and I should say that the Massachusetts Medical Society was very strongly against this ballot question back in 2012. Uh, I think a lot of doctors uh, are just sort of keeping their heads down uh, around something that's controversial, uh, as well as the feds have been fairly severe uh, in uh, enforcing uh, the overuse of pain relief, pain medications. A number of doctors have uh, gotten into uh, some licensing issues uh, around that. So uh, I s think that uh, just uh, there's some gun shyness, but uh, uh, I'll let Jill talk to uh, Dr. Griffin talk about uh, how she sees the profession dealing with this. Um, I think the biggest issue for large groups, most physicians belong to large group 
practices or hospital-based practices. And I think the largest concern has to do with Medicare reimbursement, where um, Medicare is a federally funded program, and if you're writing an, a, a recommendation or certification for a patient, and somehow Medicare would find out about it, it that somehow reimbursement would be um, in trouble. It, I haven't ever heard of that happening. That's one thing. Another thing is there's a whole group of doctors out there that um, have not um, been educated yet about the benefits of marijuana. So they see medical marijuana as a stepping stone to legalization um, that was a political move and they would just like to be left out of the politics of it. And then you have a third group who work for the big hospital based or the big private groups who've been told by the higher ups that they can't write for it. And so they may be in favor of it, but they're just not allowed to do it. And so they send them to me. Ezra Parzabak, uh, you're a medical marijuana educator. Mm -hmm. What is that? What do you do? <clears throat> you're, you're not a, a, a physician who no. can certify patients, but you do have a role here. Yes. I. Um, I fill the gap. So there's the doctors who, like Dr. Griffin said, she's very limited in what she's able to do in terms of helping patients. And then there's the legal issues, but so much of it is education. So a lot of people who are, a lot of adults especially, who are discovering that this is something they want to try medically, often because they've either tried so many other <coughs> legal pharmaceuticals that aren't working for them. Um, or they're at their wits end or whatever they've or they've been trying it in the, their regular life um, through casual recreational sources want to know how best to prepare it themselves at home and as I I was similar to people in the medical profession in that I assumed all of these ballot initiatives were for uh, a wedge issue to to make it recreationally legal but as I uh, did the research and went on Google and, and looked at the scholarly articles and scientific uh, articles on, this, on these compounds that are found in this plant, I realized there's a huge lack of information. Um, certainly within public and patients that they don't realize that there are a lot of benefits, but also in the medical field. I've heard countless stories of patients going to their doctor asking their medical professional about medical marijuana and being dismissed sarcastically as, oh, th there's absolutely no benefit to it whatsoever. And <clears throat> to me as an educator and someone who is interested in, in scientific fact, I think that that is an issue that I wanted to address. I want to have both health professionals as well as patients and parents and young people and everyone to know what the real facts are. And not just, oh, it's great, everybody should use it, but is there some middle ground of being objective about it so that I can uh, dissuade um, the Uber users or the people who believe it's a miraculous drug and has no harm whatsoever, those people need to be educated in, of its harms as well as the people who are very um, uh, resistant to any, any medicinal use whatsoever. So what I've discovered is that there's a huge um, educational um, gap to be filled, and that's what I do. What are some of the illnesses that are, uh, can be um, helped by the use of med medical marijuana? Well, um, I'll tell a story of a patient which will help uh, elucidate sort of the uh, fine line that one has to thread to uh, understand how best to use this medicine and how I would just advise a patient. So um, often I get people who, um, they come to me because their doctor has just said, well, we can do a 14th surgery. And so we could try it, we don't know if it's gonna work, but it might make your pain go away. And so a person who's had 14 or 13 surgeries often can just get fed up and lose their faith that that 14th surgery is gonna work for pain, for example. But they are sober 28 years. So they were in AA 28 years ago, and they've tried every single opiate and every single pharmaceutical, and they're worried about 
being addicted. So they come to me and they say, I, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to try. I've heard about medical marijuana. Um, I went to Jill Griffin and she said that I, it's possible it could work for me, but I have no idea how to uh, go about using it for myself. So I go online or I research and figure out what is the safest, smallest possible dose that this person could ingest and and can they work with it to discover whether it's going to help with their pain or not. And often pain is one of the major things and if it, uh, one of the major ways that cannabis it helps people. It's a very simple science that when you look into it what the actual system in the body that responds to cannabinoids that are in the plant um, how it works and you realize that it's a very efficient way to uh, dampen the pain. Is dosage trial and error? Yes, there is a lot of trial and error and there is, um, although strangely, uh, inhaling marijuana smoke is a, is a common method of ingestion medically for patients. Um, things like tinctures, things like concentrated um, versions of the plant, the raw plant itself, the leaf of the raw plant, the flower from the raw plant, the roots, the, there's all of this both scientific and anecdotal research that's going on because people are just sort of fascinated by what's happening. So smoking it isn't the only method that's right. of, of that's taking right. it. That's right. And it's not advised that we live in a culture where uh, 400,000 people a year in America die of cigarette related deaths. So it's something that people do not want to why go try some form of medication that's just smoking another type of cigarette? So they want to explore different things. A lot of people want to have a relationship with, I advise on patients who are growing their own marijuana. So they want to have a relationship with the plant and how to grow it properly and then perhaps how to use the raw plant for juicing and for um, all these methods that people are trying. You've brought a, a, a patient that you counsel with you, Bob yeah. Gunther. Bob, you use medical marijuana. Tell us about your story, your illness, and, and how you use this. Okay, I um, lived in New York City, and I lived three blocks from the World Trade Center. And I went for blood tests, and I went to Sloan Kettering, considered a very good cancer hospital. And he thought I may have what's called mild, mild dysplastic syndrome, which is an incurable type of bone marrow cancer unless you have a bone marrow transplant, which both my doctorates, Sloan Kettering, and now I moved up here, my doctor here said I would not be a candidate for it. I would probably die either during the transplant or um, or within six months or something. So I, I took, started taking medical, medical marijuana um, two months ago. And I was pretty resistant. I'm from Wall Street. I'm, you know. Uh, so I've been going to cancer support groups in Northampton, Agawam, and a lot of the men in my support group, that's one of my support groups, they recommended medical marijuana. One guy is uh, pancreatic cancer. He had absolutely no appetite. And the only thing that would help was medical marijuana. Another guy there can't sleep because you worry when you have an incurable type of disease. It's normal. And it helps with sleeping. Um, it helps with anxiety. It helps. I was severely depressed a couple months ago because my blood counts were dangerously low. I, I've been taking, ke having chemotherapy the last five months, uh, seven days a month, and there are a lot of negative side effects. Now, Azure is my uh, medical marijuana consultant, um, and I, he's unbelievable. He's, uh, my whole life has changed. Since Hagen's. Bob, why don't we um, 
We're going to go to a very quick one minute break. Um, and then we so want to come back and okay, sure. pick it up where we left off. Listen to the medical marijuana. What's the prescription making a new law make sense? Back after one minute. We are back. We are live at JFK Middle School in Northampton. This is medical marijuana. What's the prescription making a new law make sense? And this is in conjunction with WHMP, the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and NCTV. We have a great panel here. We're talking about medical marijuana and the future and the brave new world that we find ourselves in with dispensaries soon to come in this area. We left off with Bob Gunther. Bob Gunther is uh, suffering from cancer, and it's terminal to what I'm to understand um, and we left off uh, your relationship with Ezra Parzibach here who counsels you on medical marijuana and we'd like to know what's it like day to day what do you how do you, how do you experience it? have you did you ever use it before back in your youth very rarely in college in graduate school I, but I'm not no I, I very rarely I use it if I go to a party or you know, once every three years, I just, I'm, I'm not into pot. I'm not into any of those drugs, contrary to most people on Wall Street. Um, and two months ago, I can't tell you how depressed I was. Uh, I had no energy. I was worrying all the time. Um, and this is no way to live. And my oncologist said, we can't do anything to cure your cancer. We can just help deal, improve your quality of life with the girl and the symptoms. And I went from being severely depressed and not having any energy because I couldn't sleep. I was always worried. And the chemotherapy just knocks the hell out of you. Um, and the, you know, nauseous and all these other things. So. Uh, I'm sorry if I lose my thought. So it helps you with the nausea, and you, does it? it how does it help with the depression? When I I have these coconut cook uh, coconut I don't know cookies that I eat. Edibles. A edibles. Marijuana yeah. edibles. And, and then an hour later. I can't stop laughing <laughs> about, you know, for three hours. I, said, I haven't felt this good when I was healthy. Uh, and uh, it helps a lot with anxiety, which was, that's a, a normal problem with somebody that has incurable cancer or any type of cancer. And um, it helps with nausea. Boy, does it help with nausea. It helps with uh, appetite. I gained, I, since I've been on, taking mar medical marijuana, I gained 18 pounds. Um, you know, I've got to stop gaining so much weight, but, but, but I, I'd rather have these. I don't care if, yeah. But, but um, it helps with depression, anxiety, nausea, sleep, giving you a positive attitude to deal with the cancer, because that's important. Do, do you wait until you have a symptom, that you're feeling depressed, or you have anxiety, and then take the cookies, or do you just do it as a matter of course when you get up in the morning? Um, I take one to start in the morning, and then if, and then I, during the day, if I'm in pain, or if I'm really for nausea, and eating, and sleeping, I, it's very important to get enough sleep when you have cancer. And it is, now I can sleep. I couldn't sleep most of my life when I wasn't sick. So it helps me with sleeping, appetite, nausea, depression, anxiety, I mean, tremendously. And Ezra, I call him up, ask him any question. He gave, gave me recipes that my girlfriend makes and um, any type of que question. Uh, he, you know, call me back and answer it, and because I, I was very hesitant. I, I'm not. If you don't mind me interjecting to that, that Bob's story is common in that he had a overdose experience with a pot brownie. This is very common. A lot of people say, "Oh, I had a pot brownie once. I felt horrible. I ate it at a party." So that is an edible that has. I, this, I didn't know it was. The brownie. I yeah, thought it was often, Trump the brownie. Right. Often people so don't I had one, and then another, and then another, and another, and then I couldn't move. <laughs> 
That's an overdose. <laughs> yeah, well, I was naive. I don't know much yeah. about these things. And, and that's, my friend played, played a trick on me. Yeah. Mm. And that's the what is common. So what I suggested, because why smoke as a terminally ill patient, is you know, have his caregiver develop a, an edible and start him off very, very slowly. Something that's also healthier than a, a, a brownie. But that to me is such a great reminder and story of, it's true, in a recreational environment, in a party environment, something like a brownie is very inappropriate. It's dangerous for people. It can have them have a really awful side effects. But here he is now ingesting it in the same way, but with the knowledge and awareness of what it can do and really altering the, the quality of his life, which is a profound uh, difference. Um, but what was it like for you to tell family and friends that this was medication you were going to be taking? They suggested it. They suggested it, and okay. <laughs> some of my friends in New York, they have cancer and they've been taking it. And uh, my ex-wife is begging me to take it, and my girlfriend's begging me to take it because I, yeah, it's not fun being around somebody that has no energy, is depressed, and and the difference is amazing. It's truly amazing. It was life-changing for you. It sounds. It's life-changing for me, and 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 I I don't feel nervous about taking it. When I have a question, I call Ezra. When I want, I mean, I, I like these coconut things. Cause I, I don't like to smoke. Cause I, part of my disease, shortness of breath. And so these cook, these, I don't know what you call them, but anyway, the coconut things mm -hmm. I have, the recipes are great. And, and I, I haven't laughed this much probably since I was a teenager. <laughs> and that's saying so. I mean, I'm actually in a good mood and I have terminal cancer and I really was convinced by going to the cancer support groups and several people there took it and it helped them with various you know with the nausea for instance with sleeping. Dr. Jill Griffin has a comment but first I would like to invite audience members we have a microphone right here so if you wanted to step up to the microphone just tell us who you are and where you live and any question or comment that you have to make to the panel, you're we welcome to it. So anybody who wants to step up can do so. Dr. Griffin? Um, the, one of the questions was about, you know, when do you take your, your dosing of your marijuana? And one thing that we recommend, most of our patients are older and across the board, whatever their disease is causes some kind of insomnia. So we don't recommend that marijuana be used on a PRM basis. We recommend that it be used the same way you would use your hydrochlorothiazide or your cardizem or your Coumadin. So we start everyone out recommending a handheld vaporizer. They're little handheld discrete vaporizers that you put an ultra small dose of marijuana into. And we recommend everybody start before bed with two puffs before bed. That way you're in bed, you're taking the medicine, you usually fall asleep, you don't even know if you were high. During the night, the brain, the cells in the brain that clean up inflammation can then do your jo their job, you have less inflammation, and then the following day you start to use it on an as needed basis. But we really try to get our patients on a regular schedule of using marijuana and there's a lot of education around getting rid of the stigma because they're afraid. And um, you're not afraid to take your blood pressure pill and you shouldn't be afraid to take your marijuana edible before bed because it's really helpful. Doc, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Assistant District Attorney Jeremy Bucci, uh, we're talking about all of the medical issues uh, surrounding the medical marijuana, um, but there are some legal issues as well. Where is it legal, since there are no dispensaries open yet, where is it legal to get the pot right now? Uh, the DPH re regulations um, sort of leave that kind of vague. Um, and with marijuana um, already under an ounce not being criminal, um, uh, I can tell you in the courts we're not seeing any marijuana prosecutions. Uh, I also recognize that there's some frustration on the part of uh, the police on how to um, 
uh, deal with the civil remedy that's that's out there now without um, any any sort of teeth to to collect the fines that they're they're issuing. But in the context of medical marijuana, uh, I really have not seen many uh, cases coming into court. The the cases that I have uh, had to deal with that have come across my desk have de have been folks that have a certification uh, or recommendation and they're growing uh, marijuana. Uh, and because the DPH um, regulations haven't kicked in to really deal with cultivation, uh, we're dealing with those on a case-by-case -case basis. And where, there, where that certification exists and it's uh, clearly not an abuse of that and people are growing it, uh, we have found ways to deal with that uh, differently than people who are simply cultivating to smoke recreation. There is a, a certain amount that someone, a patient, is allowed to have in their possession. Is that correct? Can uh, the DPH regulations address that, and they say uh, 10 ounces, uh, up to 10 ounces, uh, or 60-day supply, which they estimate to be 10 ounces, is what they are recommending. So someone's allowed to grow it themselves? If well, right so now, there's, there's a regulation in place that uh, will will take effect uh, January 1st, 2015, where there will be an application process where people can apply to uh, uh, grow their own marijuana if they meet certain criteria. Usually, it's a financial hardship, a travel hardship, um, or the like. They um, and if they meet those criteria, DPH will issue what's, I think they're terming a waiver and allow them to, a cultivation waiver so that they can grow their own uh, marijuana. If you, um, if you get word that someone who is certified to have marijuana plants in their house, and then you get word that they're exceeding that by 10 times, do you knock on the door and do you set up a, a, some kind of a case here or what? We haven't had that. Okay. If I could just weigh in on, on the access uh, uh, process, and, and I, I want to say it's an honor to sit here with uh, Jeremy Bucci and a representative of this DA's office. Uh, this is a, a quality group of people that, uh, that are uh, law enforcement here in, in, in Hampton, Hampshire County. But uh, with regard to the, the way the law exists right now, uh, while the, the state has adopted, uh, a, well, the DPH has adopted regulations to formally grant hardship certifications, under the statute, without any reference to the regulations, patients have a, have a right to cultivate as a matter of hardship until the dispensaries are open, because until a dispensary is open, everyone's got a hardship. Uh, being uh, not having access to a dispensary. Once dispensaries are open statewide, uh, personal uh, individual cultivation is supposed to be the very rare exception under the regulations of the department. And it's, it's that process uh, that uh, uh, Jeremy was talking about that the DPH is setting itself up to do uh, to create these small pockets, uh, these small numbers of, of, of certified cultivators. Uh, and but by the way, not just a patient, but a designated caregiver also can cultivate. Uh, so that right now under the existing statute, uh, a patient can uh, cultivate uh, and a caregiver can cultivate for a patient within the limits of the 10 ounces every two months. Although a doctor can give an excess certification for people who medicate uh, but don't want to do it psychoactively. What makes marijuana psychoactive is combustion and if you uh, want to use it for an anti-inflammatory effect, uh, 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 say a skin condition, something of that nature, uh, you can uh, juice marijuana uh, raw. Uh, you, you put it through a, 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 a juicer, a wheatgrass juicer, and it'll extract uh, uh, materials that will have an anti-inflammatory effect without having a psychoactive effect, so that you can go to work and, and, and do other things while under the uh, uh, active therapeutic effect of the, the medicine. But to, in, in, to get that much therapeutic effect and use it on a regular basis, you need more than 10 ounces every 60 days, and a doctor has the ability to grant that permission. The other method of access that is permitted under the law, uh, at least the way I read it, and I, my brother may disagree, is, the, um, is acquisition is explicitly protected as a, a protected activity. So that as long as you're a qualified patient or a uh, caregiver, acquiring it on the black market is something the 
person who distributes it to you is not protected. That person may be criminally prosecuted because even under the decrim law, distribution, uh, whether it's uh, a gift or uh, uh, for sale, is, is still prosecutable. And cultivation, uh, even under the decrim law, is still prosecutable. But as a patient or a caregiver, uh, to acquire this medicine within the limits uh, mm -hmm. of the law uh, is protected uh, conduct. And that's the acquisition until acquisition method for patients until the dispensaries uh, are open all across the state. We have a question from an audience member right here. Step right up. I just want to stay out of my is this working? Yes. Okay. I admire you for your, um, I'm impressed with your story of the effects of taking marijuana for your um, malignancy. It's a compelling story. I want to thank Dr. Griffin for having the courage. I think one of the reasons many physicians aren't prescribing this is because they've been intimidated on the other more serious Schedule One drugs such as heroin. And the DEA has a very chilling effect upon physicians and that physicians have been chilled. And they've learned that about heroin and this. For the physicians, many they can't distinguish in their minds between heroin and marijuana. And so I admire Dr. Griffin for her courage to stay up. I'd also like to say the historic perspective on medical marijuana. I have a textbook of Encyclopedia of Medicine from 1900. Back in 1900, it was common knowledge that Merck made a very nice preparation, that um, it, was, it was safe, it made people happy, it made them cheerful, they enjoyed sex. If they mixed it with opium, they slept well at night, that it was good for menstrual disorders. And um, I'm glad we're discovering, but it's always been known for a long time. We have another uh, gentleman who'd like to step up. Thank you for that, by the way. I'm a psychiatrist. I've dealt uh, for 30 some years with psychiatric patients, uh, including many drug users. And I've studied brain function um, and there are quite a few studies on marijuana. It doesn't distinguish between medical and other marijuana, but it's quite clear that medical marijuana can become recreational marijuana quite easily. There is extensive brain volume loss in schizophrenic patients without taking marijuana, and worse, if they do take marijuana, considerable. There's an effect on animals of various kinds, monkeys, mice. Uh, with monkeys, uh, they have a decreased uh, function of spatial memory, although not an object memory. With Mice, a very interesting factor is if mice parents mate, prior to the mice existing, of course, when the generations of mice that are the offspring, they are more likely to become addicted to things like cocaine or heroin than controlled mice. So you're a little bit concerned about this you're whole thing. Damn right. Uh -huh. Let me say, uh, I don't want to monopolize this thing, but we've heard these pins of praise for marijuana, wonderful, glad to help you. On the other hand, randomized controlled double-blind studies are what allow us to be relatively sure that we're safe taking any kind of medicine. And as far as the skin being, inflammation being helped by marijuana. I don't know of any double blind And then one further thing is a question of a gateway drug. Now, I have read a study, not about marijuana, but about nicotine. Nicotine has been shown by the Candells who are- Well, let's, let's stick with marijuana for tonight. Well, I just want to show that there is such a thing as a gateway drug and how it works, and they're going to be working on marijuana but it deacetylates a blocker that if it were acetylated, you get more dopamine in the nucleus accumbens, which is what pleasure center seems to be. Uh, and marijuana uh, blocks that process of 
the, of the settlement. Panelists, so are we concerned about any of the Ezra? Go ahead. Um, I can address a lot of those issues. I think it's great um, that those are brought up because um, this is an example in, in, for what I've seen of the medical profession taking in the double bind studies of the drug and having that information and um, being very concerned about it. And it is true that there are, I've read the study on the mice, um, and there is, just so you know, audience member, there is a double bind study on inflammation and skin. Uh, it was done in Israel, I believe, and where they do a lot of research on marijuana. Um, so it's been proven that it um, can reduce inflammation topically. Um, <clears throat> but to address the, the um, there seems to be a war between, or a battle between the scientists who do double bind experiments who are pro-marijuana and the scientists who do double bind exper experiments who are anti-drug. And it's very challenging to parse out the proper information so that you can have objectivity. Um, but what I think has damaged the um, public's response to um, essentially those are the talking points of the DEA. Um, and those studies referenced are the talking points of the DEA. But the public has a much different uh, personal perspective on the drug. They don't see the evidence. And that's, it's not double blind yet, but it's just <coughs> anecdotal evidence. So there are 40 million marijuana smokers in this country. And there's just not enough anecdotal evidence for, public to, for the public to really believe the talking points of the DEA. I would also add, if there's going to be a study on something like the effects of cannabis on generations of rats and how they can increase their addictive um, proclivity, then I'd be very curious to say, see the same study on the numerous uh, opioids that are available readily from your doctor and on the numerous other drugs that are available. So as long as those objective studies are out there and available and put side by side with these two, with the medicine, then the, I think the public can more readily accept the talking points of, of the, the anti-marijuana. Paul McNeil is the coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition. You've been very patient listening. Thank you. We haven't gotten to you yet tonight, but are you do you have concerns about this medical marijuana law and that it, it might lead to an increased usage among teenagers, for example? And what are your concerns? Yeah, I would say that's that's primarily our concern with uh, the the school district itself. Uh, I work with middle schoolers and high schoolers in Northampton. Um, we work basically to make Northampton a healthier and happier place for young people to grow up in, free of substances as barriers. And marijuana is certainly a barrier for most teenagers who smoke it. Um, the local rates are pretty staggering. And it's, 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 it actually is quite heartening to hear Bob's story. And I'm glad that you came out, because I think your story is anecdotal as well, but incredibly valuable, and it's going to be more valuable down the road to hear what the benefits are possibly for extracting the, the positives of marijuana and using them as medicine. Um, but locally, we have sort of a challenging reality with our, our existing youth rates. Um, currently, our 8th, 10th, and 12th graders who we survey every two years on any number of issues, not just marijuana, but alcohol, tobacco, other drugs, family situations, commitment to school, things like that. Um, and our rates are, are high. Uh, the 8th, 10th, and 12th graders that we surveyed um, in 2013, it was 47% for, higher 30-day rates um, than the national average. So that's high. And I would argue that we don't need it to be that high. Um, Addiction happens for most people when they are young. Uh, so when you're drinking alcohol, smoking tobacco, smoking marijuana, that's sort of the danger zone is when, you, when you're a young person. But how do you see the medical marijuana law as increasing those usage rates among teens? Great question. Um, well, we have to look at what happens with perception of harm. So basically since the 60s when we follow a community's perception of harm of any substance, in particular marijuana, 
is which, is, which is what I'll talk about. You look at a young population, you look at their perception of harm, if it's high, oh no, marijuana is dangerous, I don't want to smoke that, uh, use rates are very low. Paul, we're going we're gonna to take a, a quick break here, and then we're going to come right back to you, all right? Okay. And we're we'll come back with Paul McNeil. You're listening to Medical Marijuana. What's the prescription? Making a new law make sense a, in conjunction with WHMP, NCTV, and the Daily Hampshire Gazette. We'll be back with more right after these. Uh, Dr. Jill Griffin is with us uh, from Northampton, former chief of emergency at Mercy Hospital. She has a private practice. She focuses on certifying patients for medical marijuana use. Michael Cutler, a Northampton lawyer who counsels applicants for medical marijuana dispensary licenses, advises doctors. He's been a longtime advocate for drug policy reform. Ezra Parzibach is a medical marijuana educator, owner of the Cannabis Consultant. Northwestern Assistant District Attorney and Chief Trial Attorney Jeremy Bucci is here in law enforcement's role in this whole thing. Bob Gunther is a terminally ill cancer patient who uses marijuana medicinally. Uh, before we get back to Paul, uh, Paul McNeil, I should say, coordinator for the Northampton Prevention Coalition, which advocates for prevention and intervention to reduce teen substance use, I will remind you that you can call our producer, Michael Sokol, at 586-7140, back at WHMP Studios, and he will relay any messages to us. You can also pass a note to us. There is a table over in the corner uh, where we can uh, you can write down notes or questions, or you can step right up to our microphone right here and address the panel. Um, also, you can talk to Kristen Palpini, the web editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette, and you can go to, uh, you can tweet her at hashtag medpotforum. That's all one word, hashtag M-E-D-P-O-T forum, F-O-R-U-M. And uh, we'll get your questions on the air. And uh, let's leave. Let's pick up with Paul McNeil from the Northampton Prevention Coalition, and you were talking about your concerns with all this and all this legalization and what it, how it might affect teenagers and things like that. Lori Lozell and Bill Newman are going to be joining us for the questioning in this hour. Go ahead, Paul. I, I want to just ask you, I had an audience, somebody in the audience skeptical about the numbers you were expressing right before the break, so maybe you could speak to the source and explain sure. them. Uh, we do. Uh, uh, every two years, a prevention needs assessment survey. It's pretty comprehensive. It's nationally recognized, and they take our data, and then we ship it off to Utah, and they kick it back to us. Um, and we've been tracking uh, youth user rates across many, many substances um, for, gosh, since 2009. Uh, and so that's where we get our data. We survey almost every single uh, eighth, tenth, and twelfth grader in Northampton Public Schools, and we, we travel with those same classes two years later so that we have a nice control. I was, I was speaking before we went to break on perception of use, and usually if you have a high perce sorry, perception of harm, if you have a high perception of harm of a substance, usually use is low. Well, we're in a position right now where perception of harm for marijuana is relatively low for young people, and then you usually see a pretty big spike in use in that type of situation, and that's what we find ourselves in. I will say a third of 15 and 16-year-olds in Northampton, a third, uh, have smoked marijuana in the last 30 days, and that's 60% higher than the national average, 27% um, higher than the Hampshire County rate, and Massachusetts as a state has the third highest 30-day marijuana use rates uh, in the country. It is higher than Washington. It is higher than Colorado. Uh, these are states where marijuana is recreationally legal to smoke or use. So these are, these are very sobering very concerning numbers as it stands. We don't even have a dispensary here yet. It's also very, it's, all, it's already very, very high. And the normalization around these conversations is also concerning for me. It is, most people do not smoke marijuana. Most people do not think it is safe and okay for their bodies to use marijuana. And I just want to make sure that I'm speaking sort of for the young people who don't want to use marijuana and don't want to use substances at all to alter their brains. Um, and so that's what I'm here for. I'm here for young people here to speak for prevention, for the delay of use. Uh, it is not inevitable to use um, the decrease of use and, if possible, the abstinence. Um, if I can speak to a few things around young people and marijuana specifically in Northampton that concern me is uh, around that perception of harm. Marijuana is not harmless. It is certainly uh, less harmful. We can tell this to adults because you guys can cognitively comprehend what this means. Uh, but it is less harmful, less toxic than alcohol, than tobacco. Um, teenagers, unfortunately, don't have an amazing ability to uh, suss out what long-term consequences could be in substance use. For example, uh, you are four times more likely to get into a car accident if you drink alcohol. Uh, that's dangerous. You are two times more likely if you smoke marijuana to get into a car accident. This data comes to us from Colorado. Um, and 
that's the sort of thing that people don't want to talk about as much because uh, it's safe comparatively. And so I, I completely understand the argument around um, comparing it to opiates as, as a pain relief prescription. Um, but it, it's certainly not harmless. And I would, I'd like to speak to that. And I'd like to ask people that are advocating for it to basically share with the community how will you safeguard use? How will you safeguard our community's belief around use of marijuana? Because it trickles down to teenagers pretty quickly. They're very susceptible to adult perceptions and, uh, and to our habits. And I'd like to ask folks, what are we going to do to keep our young people safe? I'd like to address that. We will do exactly what we've done. And by the way, I completely share your observation that keeping kids safe is a parent's first priority and that the younger the, uh, a child uses any psychoactive substance, the more likely that, per that child is to have a problem with the drug. But we have made dramatic success in Massachusetts and across the country in reducing uh, tobacco use and in reducing alcohol use to f dramatically more harmful substances than marijuana without arresting any adults. We've done it through a active uh, educational program that I commend people like you for engaging in, Paul, and I really appreciate the work that you do with kids to explain to them, to help them suss out, as you say, the, dis the discriminating factors here. But one of the things I think that dramatically misleads kids about uh, about drugs is when they see that uh, alcohol and all the harms it does is legal. And well, adults too. And I mean, it's confusing. It is confusing, and, 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 and it's marijuana not is not. And it isn't fair. And what, what I think will better protect kids in the future will be consistent laws that recognize the relative risks and much stronger educational policies that enable kids to get accurate information about drugs rather than fear-based, misleading information that leads them to make uh, bad uh, mistakes. We've made great progress in reducing alcohol use among kids and in reducing tobacco use among kids without arresting any adults. And I think that that's a good prescription for solving marijuana problems. Well, let me ask a question, if I might, to Paul McNeil, as the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. It seemed, it seemed to me, and maybe you was going to tell me I have this all wrong, that medical marijuana, marijuana being described as a drug, being subject to prescription, being subject to medical monitoring, actually makes marijuana perceived more and not less as something to be wary of because, well, it's under a doctor's control. And by the way, compared to a lot of things in parents' medicines cabinets and other things readily available to teenagers, Marijuana is, in fact, less harmful. So it would seem to me that putting this, un this drug under the rubric of medicine and a one that is, is subject to very rigorous control would seem to me to add to not to its allure or its, uh, to its per the perception of it being uh, risk-free. It would seem to me it would increase the perception of it as ha having risks. And I take it from what you're saying, you disagree with that. Tell me why. Well, I just wish it were true. I think prudence is key here when we talk about how safe do we, how safe do we say this drug is, especially to young people. Um, when you look at Colorado, ever since they decriminalized, then moved to medical, and now moved to recreational, um, you look at the two sort of hotbeds of where dispensaries are, cities like Boulder and Denver, youth use rates have skyrocketed. and so. I, I mean, you would think, especially with medical, oh, this is a medicine, this is to be respected, and like you said, maybe even feared, um, and that just hasn't been the case. People still get high off weed. It feels good to smoke weed for a lot of people. You're, you're sure you're against this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just, uh, just checking, well, sorry. <laughs> against, is a funny, against is a funny word. My father's dying of stage four cancer right now. He puffs a little bit of weed before he goes to his uh, melanoma treatments, and it helps out. It helps get, get him to the appointment. Yeah, I mean, there's no question on anyone in this yeah. panel, is there, that medical, the marijuana actually does, in fact, alleviate symptoms, that, in fact, it alleviates pain, it increases appetite, it combats depression and anxiety, it helps people sleep, it's good for one's sex life. I mean, there are a lot of benefits of marijuana. No one here actually disagrees with any I think of that. Me, I, actually, I would, I, would almost, I would hedge and almost disagree if you wait to smoke consistently or chronically 
into adulthood, which very few people do. If you wait to smoke weed or use weed, even recreationally, and we, we're thinking about, I'm glad Bob waited so long. It's probably one of the reasons why it's working so well for him. Um, but if you smoke when you're young, even you know weekly, there was an Australian study cited in the Harvard Medical Journal uh, about uh, teenagers who smoked, this is 14 to 18, teenagers who smoked weekly were uh, twice as likely to suffer from anxiety or depression later in life, after the age of 25. If you smoke daily, that, that population of 14 to 18 year olds, four times more likely to suffer from depression or anxiety. So it might be able to help an adult with acute symptom response with depression or anxiety, but it exacerbates it from a lot of teenagers who do use it. And I think about a lot of friends as young people who did use chronically, and they seem to be a little more kind of weary of what did it do? I mean, a lot of the times they, they don't know. It's, there's a lot of kind of wild long-term consequences that they just weren't aware of. I, I think you have to be really careful uh, drawing that conclusion. This is Dr. Joe Griffin. We're talking about correlation, not causation. And Absolutely. You know, and you do not know if those people had anxiety and therefore used marijuana or used marijuana and developed anxiety. And, the, and until it's legalized and we can have the trials here in this country, we won't in the United States have that answer. We have the answer all over the world where there are randomized controlled trials. And anyone who thinks that they don't exist, just talk to me afterwards. I have stacks of textbooks. There's 20,000 papers that exist. The United States does not recognize research that's done in Europe. I, d I don't know why. Um, Could you sum up some of the research that you've, that you've looked at that have helped you make your decisions about this? Well, I think one really important thing to separate out is that I don't see kids in my practice. And I was an emergency physician, and I routinely took my Percocet stamper and stamped out 30 or 40 Percocet prescriptions before I would start my shift because it was much more efficient, because I knew I was going to give out um, that many prescriptions. So, you know, I really have to... I have to look at this in terms of a harm reduction model. One, I don't take care of kids. And two, of all of the recommendations that I've written in the past two years, I've only had two people have bad reactions. When you compare that to the thousands of people that die every year, not because they took their medication incorrectly, but because simply their medication killed them, I. I'm sorry, I, I cannot go back to writing Percocet prescriptions and pretending that marijuana is this big, huge problem, because it's just not. Yeah, if I may, I would like to speak to, you, well. to the study um, that Paul brings up, and also the, and, and just addressing too that, especially the teenagers that are listening to this, when they hear both things, when they hear the statistics on harm, the statistics on uh, marijuana leading to depression and anxiety, which there are studies out that that use marijuana for depression and anxiety. So again, yeah, but we don't know enough. Yeah, we don't know enough. So but let's be clear on that. We don't know enough. That's true. I well, actually do know enough. Actually, no, actually, we do know a lot. Yeah. We know a lot. We know a lot. No. And the reason, and the reason we, we don't, don't know enough. more is yeah, because I the federal know. government has prohibited exactly the kind of research we knew we need so we could know the strands, know the dosage, know all this. We could have all of this solved if it weren't for this reefer madness, nuttiness that has gone on in this country for decades. We don't know enough about. No, we do know I mean, enough. No, excuse me, youth. We don't know about enough about youth use and long-term consequences. We don't. Yeah, and so, uh, and I will. Uh, that's I, not for madness that's just prudence let's just wait and see no yeah and to not on in Colorado to, to argue your side Paul yeah. um, and this is important to me because I really um, I, I it's very important because sadly the D you know, so here's a uh, this is a quick for the audience cancer Google search cancer.gov so this is the government the federal government's information website on cancer and apoptosis apoptosis is program cell death it's and you can go to the federal government's cancer website page, and it will detail all of the solid, double-bind, objective scientific tests on marijuana, and, and, excuse me, and 
it's right there. They will tell you about apoptosis. They will tell you about uh, anti-emetic and about um, uh, anti-inflammatory. It's the information is on the federal government's website. So if you're a 15 year old and you want to know if we have all the right information, you can go to cancer.gov because your grandmother is also using it and there's all the medical information. But the federal government via the DEA says there's no medical use for the drug. So again, that's very confusing. But I do want to tell the youth, the same youth, and I would love to speak to the youth that, that you work with, that the study out of Australia is very compelling. This is a, that you re referenced. This is a study that followed over a thousand kids uh, born in the early 70s and followed them for 30 years. And although the depression, anxiety, that can be debunked because of what J Jill said, it's causality. It's not causation. Uh -huh. But there are some, there is some raw, and I, I did this research today because I wanted <laughs> to know for this, this forum that um, there's some research, and I'm curious if you know about this study, Jill, um, on r reduction of, of cognitive abilities even after uh, marijuana use stops for kids uh, who are early onset. So essentially, what I've been able to gather, if you're very young, if you're under 25, when your brain is still developing, and you're a chronic user, that there is, seems to be evidence that it is very harmful. And Which is, if I can just say something to that, I don't know why people are clapping when I'm advocating for young people to not use marijuana. That's a little bit concerning, guys. This They're not clapping for that reason. I I that, think but that's all I'm speaking to is young people delaying, <laughs> decreasing, or not using until later when their brain develops and it's a little more resilient and strong. It's right, just, it's really just. clapping for the research that's been proven for the medical use. And I'm not, and I'm not refuting. I'm not refuting that. I'm talking about. We're, I'm just talking about okay. the effects on young okay, people, okay, which we're speaking to. But how does this medical marijuana increase the use by youth in this county? What, so Why we don't know yet. Are you saying? Are you predicting that it will? I, again, I can't say that. We don't know. That would be another causation without correlation. I just know that the youth use rates in the primary cities that rolled out dispensaries in Colorado, youth use rates certainly went up. But you're talking about legalization of marijuana. No, now. no, just. The, the whole gamut. So from decriminalization, the shift to medical, and then the shift to uh, recreational. It's increased the entire time. And just to take the sort of charge out of marijuana, out of curiosity, do you work with other, like prescription medication is Absolutely. a common thing. So Absolutely. How do, how do you look at comparing the two? So harm reduction, or do you, do you uh, I assume you don't tell kids to delay their Percocet use or their Ritalin yeah, we, That's a good question, Ezra. We, we usually say use as doctor prescribed. Um, the, one of the challenges with the, the, the harm reduction approach with some, saying, you know, if, if a teenager has a choice between Percocet and marijuana as a pain reliever, like a doctor prescribed pain reliever, it's, that's tricky. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I don't know about that. I just think about, for instance, Bob's situation or my dad's situation. I don't think marijuana would help with all the pain. I think it helps him with, with some of the symptoms he gets from the pain meds, right? So to say like, hey, t use marijuana instead of this crazy intoxicating addictive opiate, I don't know if it's that simple. And I think it's that complicated when we talk to our teenagers about using uh, Oxycontin and using Percocet. Uh, after they get their wisdom teeth out. This is a great message for folks once we're on, since we're on uh, opiates. Just use as directed. You, you can actually advocate for your child after uh, an ACL knee surgery or a, um, or a wisdom teeth pull not to get 40 Percocets at the pharmacy. I tried to do it myself um, when I had my wisdom teeth taken out with the actual oral surgeon. And he said, I, I'm just going to give you 40. And you know, I'm like talking with blood in my mouth saying, please don't give me 40. I'm very cognizant of the overprescribing that's happening. Uh, so you can advocate for, you know, give us three, we'll call you back if we need more. That sort of a thing because right now, today, more than 50% of people using heroin did not start by using heroin. They started by using a doctor prescribed drug. So it's really complicated. 
And I absolutely, marijuana is less the, harmful, the but it's reality, a very different how drug. How is this conversation morphed? Here. How is this conversation morphed into a discussion about yeah, heroin? And how do we deal with opiates and prescription I, 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 drugs? I understand that, but I think that this so is essentially misleading to sort of get into this gateway drug idea. I didn't say it was a gateway drug. Okay. <laughs> he asked me about opiates, what we do about prescription drugs. I'm specifically educating po folks on how to advocate for safer relationships with prescription drugs. Can we talk about, can we talk with someone who's in the trenches? Assistant District Attorney Jeremy Bucci. You deal with young people all the time. Do you see anything like what Paul is talking about here? Do you see people that are, that are having issues with marijuana that that you wish somebody stepped in or intervened or something earlier? Are you, are you seeing any of this on the street? Um, I can only give you sort of my experience over the last 14 years as a prosecutor. And I can tell you I've never prosecuted a person using heroin that didn't also at some point in their life use marijuana. <laughs> Coke and cola and milk are not psychoactive, and they're not, they're not, uh, caffeine, caffeine actually is psychoactive, and habit forming, but I mean, I know that that was a joke in jest, but I, it is, it is concerning when people sort of, um, sort of approach marijuana as this benign, I, even, there was a gentleman at a workshop I was at in Ber Berkshire County a few years ago who compared marijuana to like, I think it was an herb like, uh, what did he say? Like uh, parsley or something like that, and that's so disingenuous. And uh, people have addictions to marijuana, unhealthy relationships with marijuana outside of medicinal. So it's not a benign drug. It's something to take seriously, especially when we're thinking about how do we have a safe relationship with it as a community. It demands a really broad, intense set of thinking around it. We have a uh, question from an audience member. I'll read it here. Has uh, this could be for any of the panelists. Has increased rate of use locally among young people been directly related to negative short or long-term outcomes? And if so, has it been controlled for mental health or other factors that may impact negative outcomes? Anybody want to tackle that one? I will say this. If, you, if you're a teen, to me, a teenager is so hard. You need all the help you can get. The parents of a teenager need all the help they can get. Um, and again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that weed gets you high. It makes you feel good. Uh, a lot of, most teenagers when you ask them, you know, what do you get out of smoking marijuana if you ask objectively and non-judgmentally? They say, it feels nice. Let's talk, Ezra Parzabah, can we talk a little bit about what I have heard referred to as honey oil? Mm -hmm. This is an extract of the marijuana plant, um, which very low THC, so you're not really getting high. However, you are, there are tremendous benefits from this, correct? Well, honey, so that's a, there's many terms for many different types of marijuana. Honey oil that I know of, I don't know if you know this, Jill, is something that is very high in, in THC. So that it's an extraction. It's basically increasing the percentage of the resin that you have, that you're accessing via your pipe or ingesting. And it's different from non-psychoactive oils such as CBD oil. So CBD ca cannabidiol is a um, popular new compound that's been discovered in, in cannabis that has uh, psychoactive diminishing properties as well as anti-inflammatory properties. So you can actually go on Amazon and buy some hemp CBD oil. It has, you don't feel any of the effects, but you can still have anti-inflammatory benefits from it. Um, and that apparently is completely illegal. And there's, in fact, r legislation to try and have CBD-only uh, oils or CBD-only medical marijuana in certain states, um, which is debatable. Uh, but there, as Mike said, too, there's different ways of ingesting the marijuana that allows people to mitigate the psychoactive effects of it. I will say this. Uh, someone mentioned Europe. We don't respect what's happening in Europe with testing of marijuana. And there was a British pharmaceutical company that has won uh, US FDA orphan drug status on uh, a cannabis extract used for children with severe ep epilepsy, Dravet syndrome. Uh, it's called, ep I think it's Epidiolex. I don't know how to pronounce it. Uh, but that's one way to sort of, sort of bona fide the medical marijuana front is to go through the FDA, the US FDA. So that's one thing that is happening. It's, a, it's an orphan drug status. 
it's probably going to pass. And there's no reason it wouldn't. I mean, cannabidiol has almost, I mean, there's zero, right? I mean, clinical research that says that there's zero psychoactive Paul, we're going to uh, cut you off yet again. Uh, <laughs> we have to go to break. What? Uh, <laughs> this is going to be a one-minute break. When we come back, we have another audience member that was going to step up to the microphone, so we're going to come right back with you. You're listening to Medical Marijuana, What's the Prescription? Making a New Law Make Sense on NCTV and WHB, along with the Daily Hampshire Gazette. We'll be back in one minute. We're back. We're live at the JFK Middle School in Northampton. Bill Newman is here. Laurie Lozell, the managing editor of the Daily Hampshire Gazette. Kristen Palpini, the web editor from the Gazette. The news director for WHMB, Denise Vozella, is here. And our excellent panel that we put together for medical marijuana. What's the prescription? Making a new law make sense. This young woman has been waiting for a long, long time to step up to the microphone. Go right ahead. Hello, my name is Michelle Caskey. I live in Northampton. I'm a psychiatric APRN. And I appreciate the opportunity to have this intelligent discussion. And I wanted to juxtapose uh, Mr. McNeil's um, mention of perception of harm with Mr. Gunther's description of perception of benefit. And I think that what we have here is the medical marijuana laws that we're discuss discussing. And no one is saying that teenagers should be using marijuana. And I don't think anyone is saying that cancer patients should not be using anything at all that's available to them to benefit their symptoms, their disease, anything that gets them through. But one thing that came to my mind, and maybe one of the panelists can address this, is the model for um, medical dispensaries and even legalization distribution in um, California and Colorado is that if you go to Denver or you go to Boulder, there are dispensaries on every corner. In the, the Massachusetts model for uh, the, the dispensaries that will hopefully eventually soon be available here, there's going to be one dispensary per county. And I think that in and of itself will impact the way um, it affects our communities it, and the availability to patients who need it and the unintended availability to um, our teenagers who don't need it. And I'm hoping that someone on the panel might address that. Well, if I could speak to that, uh, under the Massachusetts statute that exists right now, uh, there is a cap on uh, distribution sites, on uh, dispensary facilities of 35 in the entire state, uh, 6 million uh, people in Massachusetts. And that's a dramatically lower percentage than uh, our retail outlets in some of the other, uh, the other states. And we only have... Uh, I think about 11 of those uh, facilities coming online sometime in the next several months. So uh, one, uh, so I, I, I take the questions, uh, the the questioner's point that uh, this is not going to be a uh, every street corner level of access uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, the uh, the law says that there uh, shall be at least one in each county and not more than five. Uh, in any county. So we have a ways to go to get to a saturation point, and hopefully by the time we get to a greater level of uh, outlets, uh, number one, we'll, we'll have a greater familiarity with this, not just here in Massachusetts, but in the other states, the now four states that have gone to full bore non-medical legalization, Colorado, Washington, uh, Alaska, and Oregon. And uh, we'll also have, uh, you know, just some more uh, experience with education, with, with ed educating kids, giving them the same kind of messages we've given them around alcohol and tobacco. Uh, in, in a, an environment where there's a, a, a greater rationality between the way we treat marijuana and these uh, far more harmful uh, uh, substances. So hopefully that'll go a distance towards this uh, educational process as well. Michael Culler, while you have the floor, could you tell us, are there any pressing unanswered legal questions about the establishment of these clinics that we should be aware of and or will be reading about in the next few months as they open? Well. Uh, they are protected under state law, obviously. They're licensed. And uh, under federal law, the uh, Justice Department has expressed a, uh, a guidance to all federal prosecutors. Right, but under federal law, it's still illegal. There's a, a memorandum from now former Attorney General uh, Eric Holder, about to be former Attorney General Eric Holder, uh, saying we're not going to prosecute as long as you're in compliance with state law. But that the federal law still remains. This is a matter of prosecutorial discretion that the feds are not going to bust people for engaging in what is legal under state law. 
Do I have that basically right? You do have that, but uh, w one of the things which is under active review right now uh, by the FDA is uh, reconsidering marijuana's uh, classification uh, as, as having no accepted medical use. And should uh, the uh, uh, should marijuana be rescheduled, be put, uh, be taken out of a schedule with uh, no medical benefit and the highest possible uh, addictive potential and be put into a, a drug schedule of two or lower where a doctor can prescribe it, uh, you will see marijuana legal nationally, uh, medical marijuana nationally legal without benefit of uh, state laws. And does the Federal Drug Administration have that authority? It doesn't need more legislative approval from Congress? Uh, the rescheduling is actually in the, uh, in the control of the Attorney General, but the uh, FDA is one of the agencies that the Attorney General looks to for, inf for advising him uh, or her on, uh, this, uh, on, on this authority to reschedule. So technically speaking, by executive order, as the President's considering doing in, in some other areas, he could unilaterally uh, reschedule uh, marijuana. And there is some thought that uh, he may do this before, he, uh, before the end of this administration. And in terms of you know, what the next administration will do, I mean, I can't uh, speak to a, a President Clinton or a President Cruz, but President Paul uh, has gone on record as saying that he supports state experiments uh, in, uh, this, in this policy area. So uh, in terms of what the future may bring in Massachusetts for legal issues for dispensary operators, uh, you know, there may be some more support. With regard to third-party liability, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, some concern about uh, what medicated uh, people will do after they leave uh, dispensaries and the like. And what is important there is if patients are given adequate warnings, they need As with to, any other drug. As with any other drug, if they're given adequate warnings, then what a negligent patient does to disregard the warnings is no longer the responsibility uh, of the dispensing uh, uh, authority. So that is another legal issue that, uh, that is out there. But if these dispensaries are operating with state permits and in appropriately zoned uh, locations within their localities, then uh, I don't foresee legal obstacles to uh, these operations. I would also address the legal issue that that um, sorry my phone's going off here. That um, one uh, there is now the issue of since every patient has a hardship cultivator uh, accessibility that they can grow their own because there's no t way to get it in the state legally. Uh, when the dispensaries are open, you now have possibly hundreds, perhaps thousands of patients throughout the whole state who have decided or learned how to grow a little plant in their basement or whatever, and it's much cheaper to grow it, and then all of a sudden those people become criminal because they are now required to get all their medicine from the uh, dispensaries. So I'm curious how law enforcement plans to deal with the people who have now determined that it's much cheaper, it's accessible, you know, that's essentially the delay in the dispensaries has caused so many more people to set them up. Well, Ezra, Ezra it's, it's, your, it's your lucky evening because we have the chief trial counsel from the Northwestern DA's office right here. And he also is in charge, I think, of drug prosecution. So the question is yours. The floor is, is yours. Jeremy Mucci. You know, I think that we have at the Northwestern DA's office taken a, a, a measured approach to looking at each case on its own facts. And um, the question posed, I think, by Ezra is, um, if a person is financially incapable of uh, buying this at a dispensary uh, with the Northwestern DA's office, and I'm, tell me if I'm putting words into your mouth, but with the Northwestern DA's office, uh, find an interest in prosecuting a person who cannot financially otherwise afford their medicine, from growing their medicine. Uh, and in that hypothetical, I can't imagine that we would find much interest in prosecuting that person. Um, but again, that's a case-by-case -case, uh, analysis. It's, and I think we've, we've taken our time to really look at each and every 
case on its facts. Can, we, can, can, we, I have a can I have a clarification on the law just from one of you on this, or Michael, whoever can answer it? At this time, given that the dispensaries, dispensaries are not open, is it legal for a person who has a medical marijuana certification to grow marijuana for his own use? I would say yes, under the statute. Uh, until the, uh, uh, I mean, the regulations say that as of uh, the first of this year, uh, the first of this coming year, that in order to be lawfully recognized under the program, you you need to uh, uh, you need to register with the state. But it's always, but but that's first of all, that's a prospective uh, situation, and, and second of all, where you know there, there is certainly a, 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 an agency can reasonably articulate regulations uh, to uh, out of the general terms of a statute. But uh, I have a I have a, a legal issue, a legal concern about generating criminal conduct out of a regulation as opposed to out of a statute. And I would suggest that while being out of regulatory compliance can lead to a cease and desist situation or lead to confiscation of your, your medicine, uh, I don't think that... Uh, We're talking about people who are growing their own pot for medicinal reasons but haven't complied with the bureaucratic stuff to get the blessings of the state. Is that what we're talking about? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. I, I, I okay. Just, I, I just... I'm going to translate lawyer to people. <laughs> I, I can do that. <laughs> but I also am I'm, I'm sitting next to a representative of, of this county's uh, prosecuting authority, this county and Franklin County's prosecuting authority, who said that they take these cases on an individualized basis as opposed to uh, a black and white, uh, you're either you know, legal or illegal process and look at them on the facts and, and making, uh, uh, you know, I would say sincere judgments about uh, uh, what is creating a risk of harm and what's simply serving them at a yeah, right, That said, but I thought Ira's point, tell me if I have this wrong, is that look, people are growing their own marijuana now because they can't get them at the dispensaries they need it for their medicine and that, you know what, they found out how to grow it and to have a plant or two growing that it gives you enormous relief from the medical condition you suffer from, to tell them now, oh, you can't do that because now you're forced to go to a pharmacy is not likely to happen with quite the universality that the law envisioned. Is that, am I fair on that? I agree with that. Okay. I'd like to ask a question about driving. I, I want to ask uh, Dr. Griffin and um, Jeremy Bucci. Um, so, are you? Do you talk to patients about whether or not to drive when they're using the marijuana for m medicine reasons? And um, or, and I wanted to ask you if do you think law enforcement is ready for this? You know, I'm assuming that there's going to be more people driving, and you don't necessarily get high when you're using it to treat something, but are there times when people do and shouldn't be driving and how do they deal with that and how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, I can answer that. Uh, we have an educational program that everyone listens to. It's an audio program and in it um, we talked to them about not driving while impaired. You can be impaired on cannabis, certainly. and. Um, we approach it the same way that you would approach Percocet. If I'm going to write a Percocet prescription or a Valium prescription, you can have that prescription legally, but you, you legally cannot drive while impaired. So it's up to the patient to determine, just like with alcohol, when it's safe for them to get behind the wheel. Um, having said that, um, testing for DUI for someone who's been using marijuana is not the same as alcohol because the impairments are different. So um, we haven't legislated it yes in, yet in this state. Maybe you can address how you would handle that in a situation where you think someone might be impaired. Uh, we do prosecute um, operating under the influence of drugs. Um, and we don't see it as frequently as we see operating under the influence of alcohol. Um, but uh, we typically are looking for, uh, I, can, I can tell you that I know law enforcement is struggling with this. It's been written up in the New York Times and in the New Yorker. It's not um, actually a very, um, uh, it's not an, an issue that isn't being talked about and isn't being studied. Um, I can, uh, I sort of uh, agree with Bill uh, that uh, we would have a lot of these answers a little, um, more readily available had we been uh, doing th this type of research here uh, more um, or at all. Um, and 
I, I regret that we don't have that information, and I think that it's going to be a learning curve uh, for law enforcement especially, um, uh, where to draw those lines and, and how to test whether those lines have been crossed. Um, is there a way? I mean, you know, there's not a breathalyzer for... Well, I think that videotape is a great thing because oftentimes, because we, uh, our oath is to do justice, uh, oftentimes our job is made a tremendous, um, uh, tremendously easier by simply looking at the things that the police officers see. And I think that uh, jurors are capable of drawing conclusions in the same way if we have videotape of impairment. Well, can, can I second that for a second? I also want to add this, that there is another crime in Massachusetts, which is driving to endanger. It doesn't require proof of being under the influence of a drug or alcohol, but simply the operation itself, if it's causing a danger, is a crime that, among other things, carries a jail sentence and, and a potentially quite severe jail sentence and requires an automatic loss of license as well. So that's another way that this, that would be approached. And if I could just add a point about uh, uh, impaired operation, uh, in at least one state, uh, there are per se laws. I mean, we have a per se law in Massachusetts that's for alcohol that says if you blow uh, 08 or more, there's a presumption that you're uh, impaired. In at least one state, there's a presumption that you, that you have a blood level uh, of above uh, 0.05 nanograms of, uh, of a cannabis metabolite in your system, that that is a presumption of impairment. The problem with blood testing is that uh, the metabolites of the, 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 the evidence uh, the uh, molecules that uh, that show that you uh, uh, metabolize cannabis in your system uh, stay in your system far longer than the impairment effect uh, exists, so that there are problems with that. I completely agree with uh, 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 Jeremy's uh, assessment of video cameras as being the uh, the coin of the realm in uh, in demonstrating impairment. Uh, I would suggest that if there was a, a cruiser cam and every single person, regardless of their uh, type of impairment, uh, was put in front of that video and then told to, to walk the line and, or, or, or go through a field sobriety test that was videotaped, uh, I, I would imagine there would be far fewer criminal trials going after the intoxilizer, the breathalyzer uh, testing requirements and the expert witnessing that goes on in alcohol cases. If the jury could see the, the, the driver staggering all over the place, those cases might not ever get tried. The last thing I'd say, though, about uh, marijuana impairment is uh, last week uh, in Nevada there was a, uh, a national business conference uh, for uh, uh, participants in the cannabis industry and at that conference was a presentation by a Canadian company uh, for a uh, breathalyzer uh, uh, measuring device that could uh, that can tell if you've ingested marijuana within the last two hours and to have that kind of testing to show that uh, you know within uh, a period, of, uh, a brief period of time, while you it would still have a psychoactive effect, that you could have a, an objective uh, measure. I think that would go a distance towards demonstrating uh, a, a, a reliable way of, of prosecuting impairment. Before we're uh, done here uh, tonight, um, I'd like to bring Bob Gunther back in. Uh, Bob, you're basically the everyman of this uh, panel. Uh, you're dying of cancer, and you're using medical marijuana in a you're ingested in a, in a, in a cookie type form um, you've never had any experience with the drug culture before and I think that there's a lot of people maybe in the audience and maybe listening at home or maybe watching on TV are in the same boat that you're in that they've got some kind of an illness they've never had any experience with the drug culture one of the things we haven't really talked about today is what is the first step what do you do what is the first thing that you do when you want to get involved with this well I went to the cancer support groups and um, I'm a patient of Dr. Griffin, which I want to thank her for certifying me. And then, I'm sorry, I have chemo brain. Sometimes I forget. And the chemotherapy, it's, what did I just say? Sorry. I can answer it. Okay. Actually. The first thing that you should do is talk to your own doctor. Because the best situation is that your primary care provider is on board. They manage all of your care. I think it's very sad that I have to be in business because if every single doctor who took care of their dozen or so patients that qualified would simply say, oh yeah, you have cancer and anorexia, you can't eat, you're nauseated, you qualify for marijuana, do you want me to 
file the paperwork, we'd be done and this, this wouldn't be a big deal. If your doctor says no, then your next option is to come to see someone who's considered a consultant. The problem with seeing a consultant is that we have to start over from um, day one and review your records, so we can't take insurance. If you see your primary care doctor and really push them to give you the certification, this is just part of another visit, and you shouldn't have to pay a dime extra to come and, and see me. And, um, but that's the way you should do it. See your primary first, and if it doesn't work out, come and see me. So are you hoping that more doctors will get on the bandwagon? Oh, and, yeah. And I'll go back to being an ER doc. Uh -huh. Yeah, just put me out of business. Well, so right what do you think do. it will take? And, you know, do, are you talking to doctors trying to educate them? Yeah. I, I have a lot of stage fright, but I still go out and give talks um, and try to educate people about the benefits of marijuana, but it, I think it'll have to come from the top. You know, Cooley is going to have to say to CDPA docs, it's okay to write for it. Mass General is going to have to do it. Bay State's going to have to do it. And the doctors are going to have to feel protected in some way by their employers. Is there another example of an, another kind of drug that became legal that doctors don't prescribe? Just curious. It's Well, tobacco. Well, that's... I'm talking about a drug. Oh, no, tobacco used to be recommended by doctors. And then they did a ton of studies. And then when the US the FDA got involved, they realized this is not a healthy thing, right? And it, that's one of the things that concerns me about uh, calling marijuana medicine and not just focusing on the extracted chemical compounds that are beneficial. Um, when, for example, my father, when I was asking his oncologist a couple of weeks ago, I asked him, I was like, can my dad get medical pot? I think it'd really help him out. He specifically said, I, I'm not going to recommend something that's not US FDA approved. And so until they extract all of the good and decrease all of the bad of marijuana, and then we won't be hearing about marijuana or cannabis. We'll be hearing about Epidiolex. We'll be hearing about these chemical compound extracts, similar, similar to what they did with, with Oxycontin, opiates, similar to what they did with willow bark. Um, we don't call it medical willow bark. We call it aspirin. And it was after you know, years and years of study through the US FDA. And I think that'll help change it. And I think that's something that's necessary. If I can bring up one thing about sort of the disingenuous gap between calling marijuana medicine and then modes of consumption, uh, something that happened in Colorado specifically around medical marijuana and dispensaries is edibles. And we were talking about edibles before. It seems like there certainly are smarter ways to have people self-dose with edibles. but. There were 18 companies that produced gummies, uh, seven companies that produced cereal, 18 companies that produced cookies, six companies that produced soda, 14 companies that produced juice, 12 companies that produced granola bars, and 23 companies that produced chocolate bars as soon as medically legal marijuana was okay in Colorado. And that just seems really disingenuous. And when we're trying to protect young people, like really little kids. Wait, wait, I don't see why it's disingenuous. It seems like people might not want to smoke it. They well, might no, want I'm to. I'm thinking about like the safety wise. Like if a child finds a gummy, like a gummy bear that has like, what is it, six, I don't know the average, like six hits of THC in it, it doesn't look very concerning, you know? It's true, Paul, that, that and there have been cases of kids ending up in the hospital with uh, toxic amounts of marijuana. But what do you think if a two year old, what do you think if a oh, two, no, 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 no. I want to speak here. Okay. A two-year-old, what do you think is going to happen to a two-year-old that eats a cigarette butt? Really bad stuff. They're going to die, 100%. It is 100% fatal. This is a discussion about medical marijuana. Mm -hmm. This is not a discussion about children. Medical marijuana is not for children. I understand your concerns. It could be, though. But no, it no. could be. But now wait. You've had a lot of time to speak, and I'm actually getting upset here, and I don't like to get upset. Medical marijuana, I am the expert in this community on this drug, and it helps thousands of people, and I do not want medical marijuana to be undermined because of your arguments about children. I do not see children 
and I want this to stop right now. I, I'd just like to offer two observations. First, in Massachusetts, we have labeling laws, and uh, packaging for candies in Massachusetts is prohibited. So whatever was the experience in, in Colorado, it's not, it already. It's, it's not going to be the, the situation here. Um, uh, the it's second point. Last minute, just to let you know. Uh, well, the, the the last point is 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 testing. Uh, medical research has been blocked by the federal government for 40 years. We have uh, research going on with, with LSD. We have research going on with the MDMA that is uh, uh, going through FDA process. FDA has approved medical marijuana testing, and the government has blocked that research. So the reason why we're in the situation today that Jeremy spoke of and that uh, uh, the others have spoken of is because the federal government has obstructed uh, much of the research that would be in a better position to answer the issues that Paul has raised today. Well, that's going to do it. <laughs> uh, we, I think we scratched some of the surface here tonight. I want to thank our great panelists, uh, Dr. Jill Griffin, uh, Michael Cutler, Paul McNeil, Ezra Peisenbrock, uh, Jerry Mabucci, and Bob Gunther. Big round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> this has been uh, an NC NCTV, WHMP, Daily Hampshire Gazette, simulcast, medical marijuana, what's the prescription, making a new law make sense. Tomorrow morning from 8 to 10 a.m., we'll be broadcasting this whole thing in its entirety from 8 to 10 on 96.9, 1400, 1600, WHMP tomorrow. So for Lori Lazell, Denise Fozella, Bill Newman, Kristen Palpini, Al Williams, I'm Bob Flaherty. Have a good night, everybody.